when I saw that Russia was going to collapse, I knew that Cuba would be caught in the tailspin because we relied on them as our major export market and they were not going to buy our sugar anymore. And that's what happened, of course. And uh, he said, so I stopped teaching Marxism, Leninism, because I realized that it was a moral problem. So I tried to teach multicultural ethics, but the students go to sleep when you teach multicultural ethics. Uh, but they tell me they don't go to sleep when you teach ethics. So I want you to debate me tomorrow morning in front of the faculty of the Department of Marxism and Leninism on the nature of human ethics. I mean, what an opportunity. Uh, no way I'd say no to that. I said yes immediately, not having a clue what I was going to say, but that was all right. Um, I had one evening to think about it and say my prayers and, or, or do all the right things. And I had several starts, because starts in debates matter, uh, depending on what you're aiming for in the long run. And uh, ah, it's like chess. Uh, and I knew they would work, but I also knew there was a much better way to do it. But I didn't know what it was. But I was absolutely certain that it existed. Um, this is a Christian phenomenon. As, as Jesus says to Nicodemus, you can't get to where you want to go from where you are now unless the spirit gives you the understanding. It won't happen. That's still true in all sorts of areas. And... Uh, I talked with my Canadian Colombian translator and said, look, this is what I plan to do. And we got it organized. And then I got to my seat. And when I was called and I got up from my seat to walk to the lectern, 10 steps, the good Lord removed the whole of the work I'd done the previous night completely and replaced it with something much, much better. Uh, and I said to Hugo, I said, look, what I told you is not going to happen, so you better pay attention. Um, he said, "I oh, this should be fun. I said, I hope so. I'm not sure, but we'll see. I want you to write on the blackboard behind me in Spanish, this message assembled itself. So he did. Then I asked the profs in the Department of Marxism and Leninism, if you'd come into the lecture room and found this written on the blackboard, what would you make of it? What would you say about it? And they're much better than Americans at engaging. They like debate and talk and that sort of thing. So they said, yeah, well, it's a sentence, but it's nonsense because the whole point about a message is that it's from one person to another. Um, there's got to be a message writer. A message by definition cannot be self-assembling. I said, quite right. And I turned around and crossed out the word message and put DNA in its place. I don't know if you've ever thought about DNA this way, but DNA is not you and me. It's not a protein. It's a coded blueprint, if you want an analogy in the real world. Now, you cannot understand a coded blueprint without involving intelligence. It's not possible. And then I started talking about what DNA was like. But before I got there, the whole audience burst into applause. I'd won the debate. The moment I said, there has to be logically a message writer, they were ready. Because they'd lived under so-called scientific materialism for 30 years and it was empty and they knew it. And of course, the DNA, I, I say I've lived through three generations of thinking about DNA. I was 13 when the code was cracked at level one by Watson and Crick, and they thought they'd got done it all, you know. This is it. We got the, the, the message as such. Of course, it wasn't. It was brilliant. Uh, and uh, the, the best way to talk about it that I've come across is uh, it's amazing that DNA can describe you and me using only three letter words. That's incredible. And only needing four letters in the alphabet. Now, it gets better and better, doesn't it? So what they realized immediately, one triplet could say start at the next one and then you go off in threes leading off amino acids. You get 300 of them in a row and you basically got a protein. 
the average protein would be about uh, 300 amino acids. But then the next thing we discovered, which is, that, so that was part one. Part two was when it started to fall apart. And that happened a long while ago, but it, it's not widely talked about because it's so embarrassing. Uh, you know, there's DNA in mitochondria. And uh, one of the guys in the department I worked in was working on this stuff and it wasn't working out very well for him. Uh, one of the problems was once we'd got found out that we got biochemical scissors and we could cut DNA up uh, and then we could stick it in a bacterium and make it make its protein. That's the way we make human insulin now uh, in E. coli. Um, much better than the one extracted from pigs and cows, except in Africa, because the, the modern one is beyond the resources of African countries. So people are now dying of lack of insulin because we no longer make the cheap one. Um, anyway, um, uh, the problem was that when we got some of this DNA, every now and again, we got twice as much protein as we expected. So we'd got 300, a, a thousand letters of DNA, 300 amino acids to make a protein, but we've got two proteins. How did that happen? Nobody knew. The guy who worked it out was a Christian in Seattle and he was sitting in his lab after midnight looking at his data. He'd got the strip of DNA and he'd got the two proteins and he'd got what he thought was the codon for start and that explained one protein, but what about the other one? Then he suddenly realized, do it as one, two, three, four, rather than the letters, because it's easier to do that way. It's, it doesn't matter, it could be alphanumeric. So he got one code on saying, peel off as one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, and so on for a thousand, and you've got a protein. Then he realized there was another code on saying, you can start at number two as well and go in the same sequence, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, and go for a thousand, you've got another protein, both functional. The probability of that happening by chance is zero. There is a number that's zero. There's not, uh, ultimate time will not do it. Uh, the math has been done by the world's greatest and say, no, you reach a point which is zero in terms of probability of things happening. That cannot happen by chance. And of course now, for you, it's all epigenetic factors, isn't it? You stick a sugar on here uh, or, or change the shape. God loves shape. So that long straight strip of amino acids, that's just, that's gold. You can play with that. Fold it up in multiple different ways. I mean, it's astonishing, isn't it, that you can put your ID code in a single cell, billions of letters, and you can fold them up and you can't see it even with a light microscope. Amazing. Uh, so now I think that I haven't kept up with this, but the last time I looked, 30,000 proteins from a single strip of DNA. That's amazing, isn't it? And no possibility that happens by chance. Listen to uh, John Lennox, uh, Stephen Meyer, and uh, James Tour talking together. James Tour uh, became a Christian because of science. He was Jewish, and he's interested in the step from inanimate to animate, the living cell, and the probability of that is negligible. Uh, Meyer is interested in the whole range, and John Lennox brings the mathematical talent that you need. He was a professor of mathematics at Oxford. So the trio between them are dynamite. And if you, when you get time to read, reading Stephen Meyer's book, um, Darwin's Doubt, will really fascinate you. And what's interesting in the, in the second edition, there's a whole, they put in a whole lot of review comments by neo-Darwinians and they don't trash it. They recognize that he has set them a huge problem. They've had at least two conferences now on trying to get to neo-neo-Darwinianism and they failed. It's over. 
Uh, it's just a matter of time, a cleaning up process. Uh, the other aspect of this that you need to think about uh, and ask questions, for goodness sake, don't make statements, ask questions. That's the key to surviving in medical school and residency and ask God to give you the question. He will. Uh, remember Nehemiah, he got a question very fast. He had the time from the cup in his hand to the king's hand. And he prayed and he got the question. Uh, questions are your life's lifeline, if you like. Uh, don't make statements in medical school. You're learning. You don't have to. And no mentor can refuse to answer your question. So learn the key questions. And uh, uh, those, that trio will help you in that. And in the, the moral area, you will be asked to do things which for you are immoral by people senior to yourself, sometimes faceless bureaucrats. Uh, we can talk about how you deal with them uh, in a bit if there's time. But if, for instance, you are asked to arrange an abortion, you can't, as a Christian, do that. Uh, but don't say no. Say to the mentor who's asking you to do this, before I obey you, sir, uh, may I ask you a question? They're bound to say yes, they cannot say no. And this is the question. Clearly, sir, abortion is not a moral issue to you, but it is to me. And if I do this, you will diminish me as a person for the rest of my life. Do you want to do that? Nobody will say yes, who's half decent. And then you can say, there are lots of people who, for whom it's not a moral issue. Uh, they won't mind doing it. Learn to ask questions. Uh, the person to teach you about questions in the modern world is Peter Kraft. If you, if you don't know of him, write the name down, K-R-E-E-F-T. Um, start with the best things in life, and you could put the last chapter of that book, uh, you could turn it into a skit for your class, and they would like it. Because it's Socrates talking to a girl, teasing her and taking her useless worldview apart, gently without making a statement in 35 pages already written as dialogue. Uh, and he deals with most of the key questions in that process. Now, uh, before I get onto the subject for now, relax, John, um, with one other thing. Uh, I just took a break for a sandwich and a cup of coffee and uh, my wife gave me instructions as usual. If you are interested in being informed of what we're doing at Augustine College. We do a summer program and we do the eight month program. The summer program is for physicians and future physicians and friends of physicians. In both cases, our idea, our intent is to teach you the history of ideas so that you know the questions to ask. History can provide you with lots of good questions. Uh, for example, this one works beautifully and it embarrasses uh, scientists who don't know this. Uh, I say, Christians should know this, but most of you will fail this test. Don't worry about it. You're just the products of a careless academe of which I'm part. In the next 90 seconds, I will tell you the biography of a man whose name you know. And just where is your hand when you know who it is? Uh, it's quite likely you won't. He was born in London to a very poor family. His father was a blacksmith. Uh, what learning he had was largely in the church, which he, he would be in church three or four times a week, where he learned to read, uh, write, think. Uh, by the time he was 11 or 12, he was already working as an apprentice bookbinder. Uh, fortunately for him, two things. He had a good boss and he was binding a lot of scientific material and he was a smart lad and his boss realized this wasn't the ordinary apprentice bookbinder and he said to him look you can read those books you know and so he started reading them and then he started going to the free public lectures on science at the Royal Society and the Royal Institute uh, 
and he loved them and he took excellent notes which we still have somewhere um by the time he was about 15 or 16 he knew that he did not want to spend his life binding books what he really wanted to be in our terms was the lab tech who set up the experiments to go with the lectures at the Royal Institute. There's still a, a Christmas lecture every year that bears his name, by the way. You can look it up for children. Um, so he bound his treasured notes beautifully, which he could do, and sent them to the president, hoping, hoping they wouldn't end in the trash. Uh, the president, fortunately for him, was a Christian man and he was impressed with the binding but even more impressed with the young man's note taking and his ideas for what should be done next and with a few hiccups he became the lab tech at the royal institute but not for long very shortly it was apparent to the boss that this was a very bright lad not to be wasted on lab tech work and all the great scientists of the world coming through London would visit the Royal Institute and the Royal Society. And so all around the scientific world, they knew there was a very smart young man in London who'd never been to high school, let alone university. In due course, he became president of the Royal Institute. The only one who's ever been president who'd never been to high school. Uh, he was he turned down the presidency of the Royal Society several times on the grounds that he was too busy. He was known to stop its committee meetings at the Royal Institute so that he could get to his prayer meeting. You do know his name. What is it? Well, I think it's mission accomplished, isn't it? No, nobody's raised their hands. His name is Michael Faraday. So important, he has an international unit against his name, and we wouldn't be doing Zoom now if it wasn't for Michael Faraday. Because when Michael Faraday was the first person to seriously propose there were magnetic fields around and electrical fields, the internet couldn't have happened without Michael Faraday. You wouldn't have your phone, we wouldn't be looking at one another now without him. And he was a deeply committed evangelical Christian. There's a Faraday Institute in Cambridge if you want more. But you need to know, we don't even teach our children who their heroes ought to be. Now I could keep you for the next three hours talking about Christian heroes from the world of learning uh, that are not recognized as such. We had a feminist professor, can you believe this, at, at Ottawa? And of course, her sisters were saying how wonderful she was in the work she did for her PhD, et cetera, et cetera, giving her prizes. They were always scratching one another's backs. And she'd done her work on the Widow's Might Societies of Nova Scotia as evidence of women setting up self-help societies. One of the students who came to our uh, study group uh, said, I don't think, and I've checked on her, that she actually knows what the widow's might is. And we said, good, don't tell her. How many of you know what the widow's might is? Again, well, some do, as I can see from the smiles, but the younger ones, you see, you've been, you should be very angry that you've been deprived of your birthright, which is to know the Bible thoroughly. The widow's might is when Jesus is in the temple watching them put in their, their offerings the rich putting in a sack of, of money and then a, a poor widow comes along and she puts in a mite which is the smallest acceptable coin and Jesus says she has given all that's how poor she was so the widow's mite societies of Nova Scotia were drawn drew on her as their inspiration and this feminist had absolutely no idea of the words she was using. They know the words, but they do not know the meaning. We major in meaning, they major, major in words, which I call weasel words. Words that are used not because they are good, but to achieve nefarious ends. Uh, values is not a Christian word. 
You only have to look at its heritage. It comes from Nietzsche because values is intrinsically relativistic. I don't use it. I ask the question, what would be good for the flourishing of the family? Not what are family values. I couldn't get James Dobson to give up family values, although he acknowledged the story uh, because he was too uh, indebted to it. But values are your values, my values, right? The moment you use the word values, you've given away relativism. But when I say, what is the truth about the flourishing of the family? Or what is the truth about anything? Now I've imposed on them in a way that they've got to say, I don't believe in truth. Uh, and I say, am I to believe that statement or not? You can't disbelieve in truth and have a conversation unless it's a very nasty one. If it's not truth, it's deceit then. I'm not to trust you because you don't believe in truth. No, so learn to ask questions. That's critical. Now, this session was supposed to be, let me see what John wisely gave me as the forgiveness. Uh, the essential practice of discipleship, the prayer and forgiveness in the sermon. Um, I'm going to take it on a fairly broad base. Uh, first of all, I asked this to the session uh, that I had with a small elite group just earlier this morning. Um, there's one beatitude that Jesus repeats in the Sermon on the Mount uh, after the first 12 verses. What is it? Well, it's this. It comes immediately after the Lord's Prayer. Have you ever noticed what follows the Lord, Lord's Prayer? If you do not forgive, you will not be forgiven. That's really tough, isn't it? And that takes you straight back to poverty of spirit. Because if you have grudges that you are carrying, Jesus says, you've got to get rid of them. And you'll be free then. You're not free if you have a grudge that's hanging over you all the while. Academics are awful at this. They remember every little slight that they have imagined was against themselves. They always tell a real academic, you give them a paper and they read the references first to see if they are referred to. Um, ridiculous, but they, that's what they do. Uh, and they remember. And they will take vengeance. I mean, the Galileo story is about academic vengeance, but that's another story. So when you pray at the end of that prayer, Jesus says that you need to think about that question. Is there anybody out there that I should have forgiven or for, from whom I need to ask forgiveness because I haven't forgiven them? Uh, it's very important. Uh, the moment we diminish sin, we necessarily diminish grace, don't we? Think about it. If there were no sin, there would be no need of grace. But grace is essential to our lives. So taking care of your grace that you may be graceful requires that you practice forgiveness and you practice repentance. Now, the next thing to notice about becoming a real disciple as opposed to a mere believer is to look at the Lord's Prayer. And in that prayer, there are three things which Jesus tells you to do before you pray. What are they? Two positive, one negative. Well, the fact that you haven't answered is enough for me to know. Do not be uh, like hypocrites when you pray. Yeah. So he gives specifics. He says this, when you pray, go in your room and shut the door. Do it in secret. Number one. Number two, remember that your father knows what you need and he loves you. So you don't pray about your needs. You pray that you may understand your needs as God understands them. And then I love the, the last one, which especially in the King James, because it's almost onomatopoeic, don't babble. 
you've been to many prayer meetings which are basically babble exercises, right? It shouldn't be like that. Uh, Simone Weil, the Jewish scholar who became a Christian, when she discovered the Lord's Prayer, she couldn't stop saying it for a day. She said, there's nothing like it in Judaism. And she suggests, and I've done it ever since, and I thoroughly recommend her advice. Every day when you wake up in the morning, before you move, say the Lord's Prayer once by rote. Make it the opening exercise of the day as you open your eyes. Then say it a second time and ask God to stop you somewhere in the prayer. And you take that stop point to use it as the jumping off when you get to a slack moment in the day when you're going to go off into your anger, your, your fantasies, whatever. You think things that you'd be better off not thinking. Uh, instead, you go to that word that you were stopped at in the morning. Now, if we wrote the Lord's Prayer, what would the first word be? Our. Would it? Are. That's where it is at the moment. But if we wrote it, would we put our first? I. I, my. Especially your generation, the entitlement generation, the navel gazing narcissistic generation. My is the word, but it's not. So you can practice, if you like, ourness throughout the day. It's not just for you, it's for everyone. Uh, that can change your life. The one that's got to be most over the last little while is hallowed be thy name. When I heard that Antifa mob at Charleston, that nasty episode, I don't know if you ever heard what they were chanting but it was disgusting and it was taking the name of the Lord in vain in a horrible way and nothing was done. It, it wouldn't even have been imaginable when I was growing up that someone would say that, what they said, but they did. And when we lose that, when there is nothing sacred in a society's life, you're in trouble. That's why the Muslims are trying to hold on to the Quran. They're, they're leaving in, in droves at the moment because of the breakdown of any concept that the Quran is a perfect, uh, unchanging word. We've now got 50 different versions, uh, all in part. And the, the, the Birmingham fragment has been sent to all the uh, radioactive dating laboratories in the world that do it well. And they've all dated that fragment as being written before Muhammad was born. That's, this is the equivalent of the 19th century attack on Christianity by liberal German theologians. And we took a hundred years to get over it. They're gonna need a lot of sympathy, empathy, because having the foundations knocked out of your world is not a pleasant experience at all. And that's what's inevitably going to happen to them over the next little while. So, uh, there's going to be plenty of room for uh, courtesy and empathy in this situation. But our world is not like that. And we should be, we, but we have lost, there's no sacredness in uh, North America anymore. A hundred years ago, if there was an argument in a bar about a moral issue and somebody said, the Bible says, that would be the end of the argument, wouldn't it? And certainly in blue collar environments, it still is actually, but they've been intimidated by the liberal elite. Uh, I live in the country now and they're ordinary people. Uh, you can still have real conversations with them starting at a much higher level than you can in the university. In the university, it, it's harder for you than it was for our Lord because our Lord came into a society where God, sorry about that, don't know where that came from, uh, had spent several millennia teaching them that there was objective moral truth in the world. And Torah represented that. And it's not an accident that the Bible says time and again, 
the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And that requires objective moral truth. Now they don't believe in that. So sin disappears. I would say to students most years, uh, I have a lot of sympathy for you because I know that many of you are depressed and sad and you feel meaningless. Uh, and the problem is that what you're doing from my perspective is wrong. But in your world, there is no such thing as right and wrong. There's only opinion. And that leaves you with nowhere to go. Whereas if there is a true right and wrong, and like all of us, you don't live up to the right, then you need forgiveness. But in order to forgive, you need to repent. But that also has no meaning for you. I'm sorry about that. They don't get mad. That's why Jordan Peterson is so much more successful in getting a crowd than we are. I happened to be at a conference with Jordan Peterson just before he became famous. It was one of those interesting God things. About a year before that conference, Sally, who organizes my life, said, you have a very interesting and unusual request. A Catholic family group wants you to go and speak at their conference on engaging youth next year. I said, hmm, that's interesting. I think I'd, I think I'd enjoy that. So yes, there's something going on. Um, we didn't have any idea, but shortly we found out how it came about as uh, uh, one of the organizers sent us an email saying, I've just been talking to one of my favorite Catholic priests in uh, Oregon. And I was enthusing about our conference. And he said, who's speaking? And I said, Jordan Peterson. He said, no idea who he is. Who else? John Patrick. Oh, I know him. I'll come. I have a bunch of Jesuits I know well. And I guess that's where the connection was. Um, and he came. Um, and I also didn't know much about Jordan Peterson. I knew that in the University of Toronto, he was taking a lot of flack. Uh, for political incorrectness, but he was doing it very well. Uh, so I, I went off to Seattle and was picked up at the airport by um, uh, an Irish American nerd who uh, loved kids. And I said, I don't understand this. Uh, this is a Catholic family conference and the three main speakers are all from Canada and none of them is a Catholic. Please explain. And he said, just run your finger down the playlist on my thing in the car. So I did. And Jordan Peterson's name and my name came up a lot. I said, OK, so now I know you like listening to Jordan Peterson. You like listening to me. But I still don't understand. He said, we have tried to introduce the young people in our parish to uh, serious thinking and we're, we're not making any progress with the Catholic material it turns them off but you and Jordan Peterson get under their skin that's why you've been invited uh, so I got to hear Jordan Peterson that evening he was on first and my goodness uh, I was impressed he was very good and it was a family conference but there were two groups of outsiders that Sean the Irish nerd said that group is because of you and that group is because of him. There were quite a lot of CMDS members who came to that conference because they look at my website and my wife puts my movements up and people turn up. But the, the, young, the, the ones for Jordan Peterson were young men predominantly in their late 20s, early 30s. That's a group that doesn't interact with church at all pretty well. And I said to, to Jordan Peterson, they queued up to, to, to talk to him, to speak to him. I said, what do they say? He said, oh, they don't say much. They just say, I want to say thank you. Because you taught me, you described me as a, a, a young man playing too many video games and not taking responsibility for anything. And you pointed out that that is a way to a disastrous life. And you told me I needed to start taking charge of my life first and working outwards and I would feel much better. I've done it. It's true. Thank you. Uh, later on, I met him indirectly again, and he said he's been in 80 countries in three years. Not surprisingly, he burned out and uh, had a breakdown. I wish I'd been closer to him. I would have told him nobody can keep that up. Take a break regularly. Um, but he didn't. He burned out. 
but he said that he cannot walk down the street of a major city anywhere in the world without a young man coming up to him and saying, you're Jordan Peterson, aren't you? Yes. Can I shake your hand? Why can't we do that? Because he is authentic. And the, your generation has really developed antennae for authenticity. Telling the truth. Uh, I mean, Jordan Peterson actually spontaneously weeps. He says it, it is so moving to have young people come up and say that, that I've given their life some structure. He's still working on his structure for his own life. I mean, he's reached the, pl the place where he says, if not Christ, whom? So it's only a matter of time. I, I said to him, it was only going to be a matter of time at the end of that conference. And he said, uh, I said, you know where this ends, don't you? He said, yes, uh, it's going to take a while. The longer, the better, as far as I'm concerned. But God knows what he's doing. But you will find uh, listening to some Jordan Peterson and using that to start conversations with your peer group as much easier than any other way I'm aware of at the moment. Uh, because he he's politically incorrect, yes, but he's not Christian, and that's a great asset. So this process of becoming a disciple, learning to pray with a shut door, no babbling, and knowing that God knows your needs to begin with, that's step one. Uh, testing whether your prayer is real by the fact that you will want either to ask forgiveness or to give forgiveness regularly, not to hold a grudge. Don't carry grudges. Don't look for joy. Lewis somewhere, I was trying to look for it in the interval, couldn't find it. Uh, but I could find the one about truth and you could substitute uh, joy for truth. He says, if uh, you look for comfort, you will not find it. But if you look for truth and obey it, you will find comfort. The same is true of joy. Jesus tells us that he gives us joy, not as the world gives. World joy depends upon music, parties, all that sort of thing. And it, how long does it last? Not very long. And it doesn't even get started without alcohol or drugs for most people now. That is not joy. Uh, the joy of the Lord shall be your strength. Uh, I go to Africa to see that. People who have joy, who have no things at all and uh, suffering persecution. Uh, a, a dose of persecution will smarten the church up rapidly because all the fellow travelers will leave and then you get a real church again. Um, I don't know when it will happen. Uh, I'm intent on keeping my farm. I suspect it will be a refuge before long. We'll see. There are already people of your age who've written to me and said, you know, I would love to come and work on your farm if we could read books together in the evening. Well, we haven't got organized in terms of, uh, uh, of uh, what that would mean in terms of accommodation, but I know how powerful it can be. I mean, one of the nicest things that happened in my grandchildren, my second grandchild from Africa, uh, Jonas, second uh, Daniel, was a real little tyke. Uh, he knew by the time he was two or three that he could control his mother because uh, she's a softie. And he was frankly a naughty boy in many ways, always teasing his younger sister um, but, uh, and refusing to cooperate with homeschooling. He refused to read until he was 10 or 11, 12, something like that. Uh, he knew he could get his mother to read him what he was in. He said, I'm not interested in cats on mats. Read me a proper book. Uh, so she would read him proper books. And he might be hanging upside down from a chair while she's reading. I said, Daniel, you weren't paying attention. He said, yes, I was. And he'd tell her what she just read. Uh, when it came to maths in the homeschooling program, he wouldn't write down. He'd just tell her the answer. And she said, I need to see how you did it. No, you don't. That's the right answer. And it was. Uh, difficult child to bring up. Uh, then uh, I realized that I could get at him uh, because he began to be interested in chemistry, uh, which is when his, how, for instance, uh, termites make their mounds. 
where's the glue, etc. That kind of question. So, um, and his mother said, I, I, I can't read these books. So he learned to read in uh, about six weeks. You know, once he decided he had to do it for himself, he did it for himself. But he was still a bit of a tyke. And I gave him not a Christian book. He got lots of Christian books around. I gave him Mendeleev's Dream, which is the story of how the periodic table was literally dreamt in the end. It's a lovely story. Mendeleev wrote it down, having dreamt it. Uh, it's true. We have the paper on which he woke up and wrote it down, complete with the gaps of the elements he didn't know. Uh, it's by David Strathern, who's not a Christian, uh, quite clearly, but writes beautifully. So I gave him this book and said, he was about 13, uh, read this book and write me a sentence on reductionism. And he did it. And it was not bad. And then he said to his mom, I want to go and live with granny and granddad for a couple of months to read books with granddad. What a wonderful. I don't know any nicer thing you can do with your grandson than introduce him to people he had never met before and see him just lap it up. When he got back, he stopped teasing his, his uh, younger sister, who is a little saint. And she said to Joanna one evening, Daniel hasn't teased me at all today. I don't remember when that has ever happened before. So Joanna said to Daniel that night, um, Daniel, what's happened? And he got a little grin and he said, well, I was thinking if Jesus came back now, I'd be in deep trouble. <laughs> and his life set out to be a practical Christian life. He got married this summer um, to a, uh, a lovely girl, uh, Christian. So I'm happy. We need that depth to our lives. Our kids have got us, they, they will look at what drives you. They don't listen to what you say. They look at what you do. They look at what matters to you and why. Um, that, you don't preach in your family, you live. You know, preaching's only gonna be a problem unless you're preaching about repentance, which you, if you're like me, you need every day, many times a day. I mean, I go through the Sermon on the Mount frequently and always end up in poverty of spirit. Don't be afraid of that. That's the growth pattern. Ah. So what are you going to do in the next little while? Jesus goes on after prayer and he talks about, first of all, he wants you to look at your treasures and ask yourself where you're laying down your reserves. Are they in heaven or are they on earth? He looks at your mind. He wants that too, very definitely. Uh, it's a rather strange verse, not to people who know the Psalms, but he talks about the eyes of the light of the body. And if your eyes are dark, then your whole body is dark. But he's implying that there is an inner light. The, the reference is really to the Psalms where the Psalmist says, unite my heart to fear thy name. Proper thinking has got to have a real foundation and it's got to be built properly, logically. Um, we now live in a world where many people tell me what they feel. And I say, well, your feelings are interesting, but I can't do much about them. I want to know what you think. Uh, you don't dismiss feelings, but you say they're not a foundation upon which to build. Because if feeling was all that was mattered, morphia would be the best treatment for appendicitis rather than sticking a knife in you. But you don't do that. And the truth of the matter is that moral feelings are highly unreliable. Moral thought is not. I was pro-choice for 20 years because I felt that it was a woman's issue. I bought that feminist line. Men shouldn't talk about it. Uh, I arranged abortions for women who had rubella before we had a vaccine with a 90% probability of a child with major neurological and cardiac problems. And I felt no guilt because I'd been taught that my only job was to solve the patient's problem and that solved the problem. She could go back and start again. In fact, that's what we were taught to say. When you've proved that that's what it is, you have to say, well, this is bad news. Um, would you like to start again? We never mentioned the word abortion. And every woman said yes and said, well, we can make that happen. 
you have to come into hospital briefly and then you can start again. And I didn't think about it for 20 years. Uh, and then God was on my case at all sorts of levels. He, he can get to you when he wants to. I, mean, I had been a funded researcher for what, I don't know, 30 years. I, I wrote a couple of grant applications a year. That's all I needed to write. One of them would certainly get accepted and I could always get 30,000 out of the pharmaceutical industry with a letter. So away, I didn't have a problem. And I loved doing what I did. And then God took my passion away. I mean, one protein got me out of bed for 30 years. The protein being studied in the next lab would not have got me out of bed. And I don't understand that. Uh, the phenomenon got to me from the first time I heard of it when we didn't even know how it was done. And that's the fact that you have a membrane potential in every cell in your body. How's it generated? How's it kept? What's it for? That was my research life. Um, and it was a lot of fun. But then suddenly I, I was bored by it all. So one afternoon I went into my lab and said, leave me alone. I'm going to shut the door. I don't want to be disturbed. Um, and I sat down and asked myself the question because it, it, it appeared. OK, I feel that abortion is a woman's issue. Can I think that? And by the end of the afternoon, I knew that I couldn't. And I also knew that I could frame the question in a way that would be difficult to answer. I was not happy about that. I didn't want anything to do with this can of worms, really, other than saying to Christians that I was pro-life, but not to non-Christians. Um, I actually called Robert Spitzer, my favorite Catholic apologist, a man who was head of uh, Gonzaga, taught quantum physics and theology, one of the brightest men in America. Uh, nobody debates Robert Spitzer because you can't beat him. Uh, and I'd met him and we'd become friends. And I said, Robert, this is what I've done. Tell me what's wrong with it and the arguments. And he went through and said, oh, I think that will work. You've got to do that. I said, Robert, I want you to tell me what's wrong with it. I don't want to do that. He said, I think you may have to. Uh, I had no intention of doing that. But as usual, my wife interferes in my life. Uh, and this was at the time when the number of talks I was being asked to give across the continent was growing exponentially. And people complained that I'd been somewhere where they could have been, but they didn't know. And she said, I can't know where everybody lives. I'm going to put, I'm going to make a website and put your calendar on it. I said, welcome, nobody will go there. I was utterly wrong. And in fact, Detroit played a major role at this point because uh, I had done a couple of conferences out here. And so they knew my position on abortion. And I'd said a little bit about how I would approach it. That's all. But the students uh, from Wayne State uh, called me uh, shortly after that website went up and said, we see you're going to Ann Arbor will you talk to us first? Uh, and I said, sure. What do you want me to talk on? And they said it will be January the 23rd. We want you to talk about abortion in Wayne State Medical School in the middle of the day. And I said, sorry, I don't do that. And they said, why not? And I said, I have no desire to be lynched in public. And uh, they said, but we've heard you speak. We think you can do it. I said, flattery will get you nowhere. Uh, I'm still not willing. And then they did the Christian thing. They said, we've been praying about it. Now, I knew in not even subconscious, I knew this was going to happen. Robert said it was going to happen. I knew deep down it was going to happen. And I said, all right, I will do it as long as it's in a lecture theater with an escape hatch by the lectern and you take me to Ann Arbor to save them from coming to pick me up. Were you there at that lecture, John? You were, yeah. Uh, I had no idea what was going to happen, uh, but it ended in dead silence. There were a couple of respectful questions from a Japanese girl, which doesn't, didn't surprise me because Russia and Japan had the highest abortion rates in the world at that time. Um, and I left without any problem. 
and I've given the lecture now well, 80 or 100 times probably. Uh, the basic structure is always the same from Harvard to St. Petersburg to Oxford to Sydney to the University of California, you name it, all over the place, uh, Cuba. Um, and I've never had a single aggressive question. And the last line of the lecture is always the same. I have laid out two worlds for you with a logically different starting point and a logically different ending point. Which world do you want to give to your children? And it's the pro-life one. They have never thought about the rational consequences of saying, I want the right to kill an unborn baby. It's a package deal. You can't avoid it. The whole thing is done by questions. The same thing. You can listen to it. You can find it on my website if you want it. And by the way, my wife would like to have your email address if you might be interested in taking the course at the college or if you might uh, want to take know about the summer program, what it's going to be each year. Or if you know anybody who really needs to take a break from where they are now because they're being destroyed by what's happening to them at the moment. You don't need psychiatrists and counselling. Feeding your mind with real food is what we do, and that's much better than counselling. Um, so the, our email address is johnsallypatrick at gmail.com. So all one word, lowercase. I don't think case matters, but johnsallypatrick at gmail.com. And we'll see that you get informed of what's going on if you send us that, that note. So back to where we go next. Jesus then talks about anxiety and basically he says, stop it. Look around you and realize that there's sufficient evil with each day and the rest is in God's hands. Don't worry about it. If anxiety is your problem, put the last chapter of Philippians on your fridge and read it every day before you go to, 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 to school. And at the bottom, put, don't make statements, ask questions. That will preserve your life. Um, now, the last chapter of the Sermon on the Mount is about judgment and how you do it. A non-judgmental society is a judgment in its own right, isn't it? You can't be non-judgmental without being judgmental. Can you see that? You're judging somebody for being judgmental. Uh, it's, it's another of those circular arguments that must therefore be logical. Uh, and Jesus knows that this is going to be a problem with the church. So you always hear frequently in evangelical churches, judge not, you be not judged, right? We all like that. Sounds good. So you, you avoid the circular argument. You just make it personal. I don't want to be judged, so I shouldn't judge. But Jesus doesn't stop there, does he? We love taking them out of context. And that's something you can't do with the Sermon on the Mount. You've got to put it all in the overall context. He goes on and he says, the judgment you give is the judgment you'll get. Luke adds, good measure, pressed down and running over. So that judgment to live that way is going to have consequences. But then he goes on further because he, he points a finger at us at the biggest problem in the church which is hypocrisy and it's what the, the world around does not like and if we get rid of it we will become effective again he says you hypocrite why do you want to take a splinter out of your brother's eye when you've got a log in your own eye he says jesus isn't funny i mean uh monty python could play with that one i'm sure um but he that's what he says First, get the splinter removed, get the log removed from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the splinter from your brother's eye. You have to judge yourself, and then you have to deal with it. And then the world will change for you. Because you will find out what you have to do. So in my case, uh, it came home to root, roost fairly quickly once I'd started to think about this, because you as a doctor should have the experience in, in due course of being asked regularly uh, to talk to the young people in your church about sexuality. If you aren't asked, you better ask yourself why, because you should be. 
because uh, it needs somebody who actually knows just how nasty sexually transmitted disease can be and has the pictures. They're all available to you. The Medical Institute has all the material you need. But I was asked to do that. And I gave an appropriate sort of talk and finished by saying the bottom line is the best life is for those who are chaste before marriage and faithful afterwards. And then I added, as so often happens with me, my tongue gets ahead of my head. I only wish I'd done it. And I finished quickly and hope that nobody noticed what I'd said. But one person had. It was the youth pastor's wife. And some three months, three weeks later, at nine o'clock at night, like Nicodemus, she knocked on our door and said, uh, I've been thinking about something you said to the young people's group. and I think I can talk to you. And of course, she was having an affair. And she needed help to deal with it. Her marriage probably wasn't the same afterwards, but we helped her to be honest about it. And as far as I know, they uh, they'd certainly reconciled. As far as I know, they, they went into the pastoral ministry and I, I don't know anymore. I would like to know and sometime. I may make the effort to find out. But there, were, there was the first time that in a single little sentence, I'd admitted that my, there were many things I had no problem with. I will never be an addict of drugs or alcohol. I will never try drugs. Uh, alcohol, uh, I use, but for social reasons only. We, we, most, most evenings, Sally and I will have a drink of some sort only one usually uh, but sex that was a different matter uh, I'd be totally vulnerable to that in the wrong situation uh, I wouldn't risk myself even now uh, but so that's what I have to talk, talk about what Jesus is saying is if you've been cured of log disease you can help people with splinter disease no pride involved guaranteed so if you're looking around the church for what your role will be, the most likely role will be for you where you have screwed up the worst. And then you can share your experience, the mercy of Christ. And there's no pride involved, no hypocrisy. If you are into helping people with problems you've never struggled with, deal with the one you have, it's called hypocrisy. I think Hypocrites Anonymous is really needed in church because, gee, the place is full of it. Uh, the fact that we don't have repentance in our services so often. If you don't go to a liturgical church, you're highly unlikely to have repentance as part of your worship. But repentance is the entrance ticket to worship. So the worship is pseudo. And you can, you can show it very easily by simply looking at the praise songs. There was one not so long ago, Our God is Able. Do any of you remember that? You sang Our God is Able about 10 times. It's that thing from Daniel. Think how that praise song would change if you added the next line. But if not, we will not bend the knee. But if not, we will not bend the knee. But if not, we will not bend the knee. That would be an entirely different song now, wouldn't it? Even that famous hint, Great is thy faithfulness, should have another verse. Do you know what follows it? Do you know where to find it in scripture, first of all? It's a surprising place, but it's almost straight from scripture. John knows. Anyone else? Well, it's Lamentations. Middle of Lamentations. Hmm? It's the middle of Lamentations. Right? Yeah, about, about chapter four, I think. Chapter but seven. Hmm? right yep. in the middle, yeah. Yep. But what follows it, the hymn? It's this. It is good for a young man to lie with the, his face in the dust. That's part of great is thy faithfulness, to spend some dust time with your nose flat in the dirt. That would change that hymn pretty drastically, wouldn't it? We like it as the warm fuzzies. If you look for joy, if you look for comfort, you will not find it. If you look for truth, you will get to joy and comfort in the end. But it's got to start with that inward truth of poverty of spirit. 
So that's what he says first. And now he goes on and he tells you another way in which you've got to judge, which as evangelicals, we're often not very good at. Uh, we like to say that we shared the gospel with certain people. The next question is, should you have shared the gospel with those people? Because what does Jesus say after the bit about uh, hypocr hypocrisy and the, the log and the splinter? What comes next? Do not cast your pearls before swine. Do not give what is holy to the dogs. Lest they turn and rend you. The timing should be God's, not yours. So when I sit down on a plane, I always say the same prayer. Lord, if you want me to say anything, you must start the conversation. Sometimes he does. Often he doesn't. That's fine by me. Uh, he goes on and he says, I know you find this hard, so why don't you ask, seek and knock? I'm there for you. You being evil know how to give good gifts to your children. Won't your heavenly father do the same? So ask. It's an astonishing passage. And it, it contained also the, the most difficult verse in the whole of the Sermon on the Mount for me. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many there are that go that way. Or to loss might be a better translation. Narrow is the way that leads to life. And few there be that go that way. Now... How does that fit into a sermon about the difference between a mere believer and a disciple? You often hear it used to preach the gospel, and it can be so used. It's an appropriate picture for that. But that cannot be what Jesus said there, because this is an integrated sermon. Now, I was glad to find out that Augustine agreed with me on this, uh, or I agreed with Augustine is the right way around to put it, but I, I didn't agree with him because I didn't know at that point. But most often you will hear it used to preach the gospel. But I don't think that's what it's about. It's telling you that being a disciple of Christ means leaving your things behind. Not physically, but giving up the sense of ownership. Fenelon, one of my favorite Christian writers, uh, about the time of Louis the Fourteenth, I think was his time, uh, a Catholic, but a, an amazing man. And he, he, we have a lot of his letters. And one in particular I love where someone like you, somebody professional, is writing about their lives and their gifts and how they should be used. And Fenelon says this, there is no gift which God gives us that he does not usually have to take away from us for a while. He does not take it away to deprive us of it permanently, but simply to take away the evil sense of ownership. Then he will give the gift back and it can be safely used. I think that's a wonderful piece of wisdom. The evil sense of ownership. It's all grace. And if we lose that, we lose everything. So that's why he takes, I mean, he took away my interest in something he'd given me in the first place. I thought the passion for science was something that I had. He wasn't, he gave it back to me, but this time from the historical perspective and with no longer any sense of ownership attached to it. That's the way it's meant to be. And of course you're free. And then he goes on and says, this is for you now. He says, those who teach, you are to test. And you test us by our works. Now, your problem for me is that you're reliant on people like John to say what they know of me over the years. Uh, I mean, I'm public enough for you to have quite a lot of ideas of what I'm like, but not the dark side of me, which I go visiting every day when I repent of it, so to speak. I thoroughly understand Paul who says, uh, I don't count myself to achieve the end, but I, I know what to do. Repent, confess, be forgiven and press on uh, and be willing to use your failures when it will help someone else. Uh, I think it was the, the, the British poet, I've forgotten his name now, but he said, faith is doubt kept constantly underfoot. 
I mean, do you ever wake up as I do in the morning and look around and say, do I really believe this story? You look around the world and what you do then, you remember to remember. And this is another point I want to leave with you. Gosh, I should have finished by now, but you're listening, so it's your fault. And we haven't had much in the way of questions so far. Keep the Sabbath, even as a resident, even as a medical student. Uh, if you want to reason, go to Jeremiah 17. There, I think if you look at the Old Testament, God complains about the Jews worshipping idols most and about breaking the sa Sabbath second, which is interesting. Uh, we're not Sabbatarian as our, the previous generations were, and I don't think Sabbatarianism is appropriate, but the idea of Sabbath, the Sabbath was made for man. In other words, we have a need for it. And Jeremiah talking to the, the children of Israel says, if you will keep my Sabbath, then princes will enter Jerusalem. You got the picture? What is the one thing you've never seen the queen doing? Carrying a heavy load. Royalty never carry burdens of the physical variety anyway unless they choose to for some athletic reason. All the rest of us do. But as you go up the scale, you carry less. So to practice being a prince or princess, if you're sexist, is to have a day in which you put all your burdens down. You don't worry about it. You just put them down and say your prayers and ask the Lord to guide you into a day of worthwhileness. My mother, who I've said was brilliant, explained Sunday to me very easily. She said, you can do anything on Sunday as long as you can take Jesus with you. For a child, that's brilliant, isn't it? You can do what you like as long as you can take Jesus with you. Uh, and the more you think about it, it, it is a wise way to sort out what you want to do at any given point. So the other thing, I kept Sabbath even when I was not a practicing Christian because I, I liked the idea. I always had a day in which I read things that had nothing to do with work. So I, I, my whole life I've had one day of the week in which I didn't do any work uh, except, you know, around the farm I do the necessaries. And for me, weeding can be a source of worship. I actually like it. I find it relaxing and uh, good thoughts come to me under those circumstances or lots of things, driving a tractor, because the, the amazing thing is the hawks and the like will come to you when you're on a tractor and they'll fly away, a field away when uh, you're not on a tractor. They know tractors are not dangerous so, and we stir up food. Uh, all sorts of things you can do that are wonderful, uh, but not work. And what that means is you come back to the next day at work fresh. And medic many medical students aren't fresh for four years. The Asian students as a group are the worst practitioners of this cruelty. I think it's because it seems to me their families put inordinate pressures on them. Uh, we've often had, we often had it, an Asian girl uh, come out as the top student on the memor memorize and dump process and then at least two occasions failed to complete residency because of course no patient comes to you with a little notice on their forehead saying I'm handout number 123. It doesn't work that way, does it? Uh, so we're not training you for what you actually have to do. Uh, there's got to be a love of learning to be a good doctor. Uh, not doing it as a chore or as a burden or as whatever. Uh, the Sabbath helps with that. You come back and you say, oh, why didn't I think of that last week? Because I hadn't had a Sabbath. That's, God strains your mind out on the Sabbath if you'll let him do it. Uh, so say the Lord's Prayer every day. Uh, get to know the Psalms. If you read a Psalm a day, you go through the Psalms twice a year. That means you know where to go on a very bad day. You know, it's true. There's a Psalm for every situation. You just got to find it. Uh, and we become stable and we become 
I don't know what the word is really, but you know, I'm in my eighties, uh, and I still do more work than people do in their sixties in many respects. Uh, I'm free. That's lovely. Um, I wish it for all of you. Uh, but you only find that when you go beyond your comfort zone. When God pushes you, don't resist. Uh, and you will, you will get a lot out of that. You will be a disciple. And all the disciples except one were martyred and they didn't complain about it. John, God. Uh... Let's let's pause here if we can. Yeah. And, uh, sure. And we have about fifteen minutes before we're going to break. So let's let's uh, uh, offer up any questions that you have on. on you like it. And you can write to me afterwards if you want. Absolutely. The Lord's Prayer and on uh, forgiveness or anything else. Can I ask a question? Um, I I'd like to hear your perspective. I just sort of hear you talking about repentance, and I just feel like you know I have a lot of training baggage i'd call it from you know needing to always have the appearance of perfectionism and so i think we as doctors just have a real problem um acknowledging that we have things that we have problems with or um, we're really good at comparing and i'm not as bad as the other person over there so i'd like to hear your thoughts on those kind of how do we deal with that because i really would like to be better at repenting and acknowledging my sinfulness. And I think I really stink at it. Yep. Well, the first thing is, uh, I remember, a, in your terms, a senior resident when I was doing my first job after getting my degree. And we did rounds and he realized something about me. And uh, I forget the exact thing, but what he said, I will never forget. He said, the bedside is no place for intellectual pride. Got it? The bedside is no place for intellectual pride. You owe it to the patient to tell the truth. Because then there's some hope that you might find somebody who does know the answer when you don't. Nobody can know everything. So one of the most important things you do is build a network of people you trust. And that's going to be harder and harder to do. Sometimes they may be a long way away. I mean, I get regular emails from people in residency because they want someone to talk to. So uh, pride in any form is always a disaster for us and a win for the devil. And not being able to admit I'm out of my depth, that makes you a very bad position. And so if you find somebody who never admits they're wrong, uh, that's, that's problematic. It's when you realize, I, I don't know what's going on, that you're likely to make real, real progress. Does that make sense? And you've got to teach it to your children. So whenever they correct you, say thank you. Uh, and when a child owns up to a lie or any sin, first celebrate the honesty and then negotiate consequence. Children know there should be consequences for bad behavior. They're perfectly willing to accept it. My little tyke of a grandson, however, I mean, uh, by the time he was three or four, when he misbehaved, Jonah would say, Daniel, that is really very bad. I must spank you. And he would put his bum up in the air and say, go ahead. And when she'd hit him, as only she could very softly, he'd turn around and grin and say, hm, do it again. Didn't hurt. She gave up spanking. She couldn't do it. He, he, if she went that way, he won every time. Uh, but we do model uh, for our children. I mean, it's very moving. My, my grandson, my son's son, uh, a friend told me, I was talking to Reese, and I said, what do you want to be when you grow up? And he said, I want to be like my dad and my granddad. I mean, that, can you think of anything you'd like to hear more? It's perfect. I mean, uh, we're, we're not fault free by any means, but uh, we try to speak the truth. Uh, 
and it gets better with each generation, you know. Uh, and that's the way it should be if it goes on, because David was not allowed to build the temple because he'd got his hands far too dirty with blood, uh, but he didn't last many generations. But I, I have one friend who can trace a missionary in every generation in his family back to John Wesley. Now, he hasn't even had many of the thoughts I've had that I wish I hadn't had. He is a grown man now looking after a wife with Alzheimer's who is as innocent as a schoolboy in many respects. Uh, it makes him, uh, people can make fun of him, but no, he's had a good life. Um, I wasn't made for that kind of life, but uh, repentance is simply the name of what coming to God is like. So get used to it. Um, and how do you do it? Well, again, a little anecdote, because you'll remember it and you'll use it in your teaching yourself. Um, a few years ago, the Archbishop of Canterbury uh, was a very, a man of few words. I've forgotten his name again at the moment. It'll come back, back to me in a minute. But just after he'd been appointed Archbishop of Canterbury, a rather pert young female American journalist interviewed him. And she clearly wanted to get something out of him that she could make fun of. Uh, she wasn't on his side and he knew that. And her first question was, Archbishop, have you said your prayers this morning? And he said, yes. And she said, how long did you pray? And he said, about one minute. She said, Archbishop, that's not very long, is it? No, but it took 30 minutes to get there. And she didn't know what to say. 30 minutes to get to prayer. John Stott would talk about the battle of the threshold. And it's right. God in his mercy doesn't come close to us because he is pure holiness. What would happen to us in the presence of pure holiness? We would be destroyed, wouldn't we? So without the covering of Christ, without repentance, that's why there is a battle at the threshold. The, the Old Testament talk about the preparations that the high priest had to make to get into the, before he went into the Holy of Holies. And they tied a rope around his ankle so that if he died in there, they could pull him out. We need a little of that. Because repentance is a gift. It takes time. And I, I don't think it's possible to overestimate that. Uh, I I don't know how churches can do without it, you know. As I said earlier on, uh, I need that wonderful Anglican prayer right at the beginning. In that the, the people who wrote the prayer book were very wise and they lived in very hard times. I mean, Cranmer was martyred. Uh, and it is scripturally incredibly rich. So for me, even though it means there's the lowest common denominator below which the service cannot fall. Preaching is not what it used to be. So I'm not, I don't go to church with any great expectations in relationship to sermons. But the fact that there will be incredibly rich prayers without a, a word being wasted uh, is amazing to me. And I know the service, so I know it's rhythm. So a bit of scripture will take me off and I'm not actually with the congregation, but the rhythm is there. And I, I will, certain bits I will never miss, you know, like the, the prayer of humble access. That phrase, talking of God before the Lord's Supper, saying, uh, whose property is always to have mercy. That's my God. Whose property is always to have mercy. Now to a scientist, that's an incredible idea. The things that we, the, the, that we worship are the, the closer we can get to the real properties of the world. But there Cranmer has put it, that God's property is always happens. I am not like you, he says to the, the minor, one of the minor prophets. And the difference is mercy. Uh, probably my favorite verse in the whole of the, the Psalms is, Truth and justice have met. Righteousness and peace have kissed. 
the truth and justice can only meet with grace and forgiveness and repentance. It's a package deal, but in every place it works perfectly if you give it a chance. And I, I, churches need creedal statements because people don't, they don't know that they don't have a creedal statement in their life. If you ask them to write down what are the the key ideas in their lives, it's not going to be a very long document, is it? And it's highly questionable whether it would stand up to biblical comparison because it's not that there's any shortage of what should be in that. I mean, the great creedal statements, uh, they spend hundreds of years over them. And then we, when we form a new Christian organization, we write our faith statement in 10 minutes with a committee. Why do we bother? We've got creedal statements that have been around for nearly 2000 years. Use one of them. They've passed the test of time. Uh, Chu and Lai, when asked what he thought about Christianity, he said, too soon to say. Uh, I mean, he was being cynical at one level, but there's a, there's a point there. So reading is the next thing. Do you have in your annual reading books that are as hard to read as your professional literature? Or do you read soft pap for Christianity and call it a book? If it's double spaced, you should think twice about whether it's worth it. Uh, real books have to be read several times. I read McIntyre's After Virtue twice before I began to get any uh, traction with it. Probably one of the most important books written in the last 50 years. The third time I read it, I picked it up on on the spur of the moment, going out of the house to fly to Africa, I wanted a book to read on the plane and I'd finished it by the time I got to Johannesburg. I couldn't have done that a few years before. Now, this really matters and I can illustrate this in a, a lovely way. Um, when David Stevens tracked me down some 30 years ago, I was in my office in Ottawa and he called me and once I'd adjusted to his accent and he said, uh, I've just listened to a tape of yours six times called The Myth of Moral Neutrality. And I said, no, you haven't. I, I don't make tapes. And he said, it's your voice. Well, I couldn't argue with that. I said, I've written a paper with that title. And he said, no, it's a tape, but it's amateur. Uh, I want you to come and record it properly because I want to circulate it amongst my membership. Because I know this is way back 30 years ago that medicine is sailing towards very choppy waters and I don't know what to do. He'd been a missionary doc, done a wonderful job in, in, uh, in Kenya, but he realized that CMDA was in need of leadership and he didn't know how to, what, what that meant even. And so uh, I said, oh, I don't have any budget for that. And uh, he said, no, 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 uh, we'll pay the costs and we'll pay you an honorarium. I said, oh, you're a Christian organization. I don't need an honorarium. He said, oh yes, you do, because we want we will want you more than once and they have i don't bother people ask me and i say pay what you can if you want to um but cmds has been wonderful for me so uh, i went down to a conference and i said i'd record some talks there and uh, that was a, a major point for me because uh, you're probably too young to remember jim and tammy baker any of you no none of you uh, they were well, one, yeah. Uh, she was the lady with industrial weight eyelashes um, who claimed to be a, an evangelist with her husband and they got into trouble and their ministry went bankrupt. So it was a cheap place to have a contract, uh, a conference. And so CMDA was using it. So a turning point for me occurred in Tammy Baker's bedroom, which was the room uh, David was uh, using. But I, 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 I think I gave three or four talks and, and then David asked me whether I would talk just to him. He wanted to question me Q&A type thing with a tape recorder run, running so that he could share it with the staff at Bristol. I said, sure. Uh, he didn't tell me he was going to send it to 17,000 doctors. Uh, I wouldn't have said what I did if he'd have told me that, but God knew what he was doing. So um, we talked for about 
three quarters of an hour. Uh, and then he said, I haven't thought about most of the questions you've raised. What books have made a major impact on you? And I just shut my eyes and thought about the books by my bed. Usually there's somewhere between 20 and 30 books on my bedside table. My wife then clears them up and then I go and get another set of 20 to 30 out, which I dip into. Um, and always is Augustine's Confessions. If you can't read anything else, you can read a paragraph from the Confessions. That, first great tell it how it happened conversion story and a paragraph will give you enough to read to think about and go to sleep in the end the book is worth buying for the end of the first paragraph our hearts are restless until they find their rest in thee you've probably heard that phrase but probably didn't realize it was augustine um so that's always there um the others move around and so at that time there was uh uh, John Newhouse's The Naked Public Square, New Begins Foolishness to the Greeks, um, Psychology as Religion by the guy from New York, whose name I've forgotten again, uh, and Alistair McIntyre's uh, After Virtue. Well, he went back to the office and uh, he played the thing to the staff. And then he said, you know, I'm going to send this to everybody. And the docs will want to buy those books. See if you can get a, a good price from the publishers. And he sold it as a thinking doctor's library. I never known five or six books could constitute a library. But when I heard what he'd done, I said, David, if they try to read after virtue first, I'll never try reading another serious book. Uh, get, give me the list of people who, who bought the books and I'll write to them and tell them which order to, uh, to read them. But I was wrong. Because, of course, doctors are highly intelligent, uneducated people. I call them at the end of that uh, that talk with David. Uh, I said they're highly intelligent barbarians. And he proved my point by putting the title as highly intellectual barbarians, which is a contradiction in terms. A barbarian is somebody with no real history. That's one way of putting it. And that describes doctors very well, because many people in medicine decided they wanted to be a doctor aged eight and coned down, cutting out everything that wasn't essential to being a doctor, not knowing what was essential. And they have got a very truncated education. David was a very good example, highly intelligent, uh, took the shortest possible route to the mission field. He could have gone to Harvard, but he turned it down. Wanted to get to the mission field faster, but... It, he, now he got himself into a job where he needed a mind and he's been educated himself. I, I played games with him over the years. I said, well, you only made two logical errors in that uh, little bit that you just said. And I, I wouldn't tell him what they were. And he, he's the kind of, he'd go at it till he, he got the answer. And you hear him quite often nowadays, he'll talk about undistributed middles, which is the, probably the most common error in politics, either me or disaster. No. Uh, Either side is likely to be a disaster, but fortunately, there's a large mass of middle Americans who don't hang in either group. Uh, we do it all the while, either or arguments, zero sum arguments, undistributed middles. They, they should usually be dismissed. Um, anyway, he, he got it going. And the result of it, of course, was that very shortly I got invitations from all over the place to speak. And over the years, I meet people who tease me, you cause me a year of suffering because I'm a bit obsessive and when I start reading a book, I have to finish it. And it took them a year to read After Virtue. Uh, but they always follow it up by saying, it's actually a book that's had more influence on me than any other secular book I know. Um, it is a brilliant book. And I can give you a taste so that you might pick it up and read the beginning and the end to start with. The beginning starts with a parable describing you uh, or your world. And he says, I want you to imagine a world in which a no nothing government takes charge. You may be going to have a real experience of this in the next four years. Uh, and they decide that all the problems in the world have been made by science. And so they burn all the textbooks, 
blow up the equipment and we'll start again with a new green world in which everything is perfect. Of course, it doesn't work. They find very quickly that things are worse rather than better. So they try to reinvent science. And they pull together the, from the shattered remains, bits of textbooks, equipment and the like, and they teach them by rote. Does that sound familiar for year one of medical school, teaching you bits and pieces by rote that you cannot integrate? That's what we call education now. We used not to. Uh, and it does not work. Then says McIntyre, what I'm asking you to understand in this book is that, and this is about 1979, 80, that sort of period. I'm asking you to understand that that is where your world is now, but not in relation to science, but in relation to morality. We have no overarching sense of what it is. And that is why we cannot produce virtue, hence the title of the book. And then he, he started as a Marxist and ended up as a Thomist a Catholic follower of Thomas Aquinas. That's a long journey. Uh, he, he, amazing man, he, uh, he's retired now, but he was at Notre Dame. He went many places, but ended up in Notre Dame. But he always taught first year. That's a saint. He said, I teach first year because I still think I might be able to get to them. But after first year, it's increasingly difficult because you're brainwashed. And he then does an intellectual history of the Western world in a very idiosyncratic way, which is a little hard to read. He doesn't use enough commas for a start and he writes long sentences, but uh, it's worth the struggle. But the end is also very clear. He finishes something like this. He says, if you have followed my argument, you will see that I am proposing that we have already entered upon a second dark ages but we should not be entirely without hope. Last time this happened, good men and women withdrew from the task of shoring up the Roman Imperium into the task of forming communities within which they could keep the civilities and the virtues alive. And they succeeded. We are waiting for a doubtless new St. Benedict. You've probably seen books on the Benedict option. Uh, he's talking, uh, some people think he's talking about the Pope. No, he's talking about St. Benedict who started the monasteries with their patterns of living, which led to real learning. Um, we're seeing it happen. I mean, Augustine in a way is part of the Benedict option. We unashamedly say that we teach on the proposition that the Christian revelation is true. Uh, and that multiculturalism is not. And you shouldn't come here if you don't recognize what that means. So that's where I would leave you on that one. Uh, there's a book list on my website. It's really a small library. But in your case, have you read any Les Leslie Newbegin yet? That's Elisa I'm asking. Have you read any Leslie Newbegin? No, I have not. Well, start with Foolishness to the Greeks. It's only a little book, about that thick. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's brilliant. He went to India as a liberal missionary and came back an evangelical and realized that the Western world, where he'd been away from for 45 years, had lost its understanding of the gospel. And it's a brilliant book. Uh, one of the ideas that you will have expounded to you is that the idea of tacit knowledge. That is knowledge that is real, but you cannot explain in terms that everybody would understand. Conversion is the best example. We are reductionistic even in relation to conversion. When, when you go to a, an evangelical crusade and then you go forward and you sign a little set of declarations, I believe in God, I believe Jesus is the Son of God, I've confessed my sins, I've asked Jesus into my life, sign here, you're a Christian. Are you? Well, not because you sign those documents. By the grace of God, it may be a turning point on your life, but as Jesus said to Nicodemus, you can't get to where you want to be from where you are now unless the Spirit comes to you 
you cannot comprehend the kingdom of heaven. Step one in your faith was the Holy Spirit bringing the whole idea of the kingdom of heaven to life in your soul. You didn't do that. And it's not done by, nobody's argued into the faith. Apologetics are just a way of defending ourselves. They don't, apologetics don't bring people to faith. They get rid of some of the clutter that's, a, that's stopping them think clearly about it. But the step one is Christ coming to us. You did not choose me, I chose you. And we all know that when we stop and think about it. Now, after that, everything that follows from that has to be done by uh, using our minds, not our feelings. We're not in control of our feelings. That's God's province. He can make you intensely happy in the most unhappy places. I've experienced that. The best summer of my life was the summer of uh, 95. My wife I hadn't seen for six months. She was in the refugee camps. I went out to see her. I knew my research in the area, which had been running for 10 years, was kaput, finished uh, because of the war. And she said, uh, the morning after I got there, she said, uh, oh, by the way, you're meeting the leaders of my camps this morning. She knows I don't suffer from jet lag. So that was no option. Off I went. And uh, what many people don't realize is that Rwanda, before the war, was one of the most church-going nations in the world. 60% of Rwandans would be in church, roughly half Protestant, half Catholic. And yet they ended up with both sides killing the other. There wasn't a good side and a bad side, which is what the Tutsi have managed to portray to the world. They were equally bad. In fact, the Tutsi are more Machiavellian than the Hutu. But we talked for about a couple of hours before we got to the question. The question was brilliant. Can you help us understand how we, who called ourselves Christian, ended up killing one another? People had killed people they'd sat next to in church. Women had burned children alive in huts because they were the opposite tribe. What happened? Now, it so happened that I had been prepared for this, although I didn't know it. And I said, I think there are four talks that I could give in your camps that might help. The first one would be courtesy of my good friend, David uh, Jeffrey, who's Baylor now, um, about the history of the re reconversion of Britain in the fifth century and how that came about. Because Britain was worse than Rwanda before Gregory the Great sent the missionaries. Uh, so you're not alone. All religious groups have killed one another. The biggest killers by far, of course, are the liberal elite who have to take responsibility for Marxism and communism and the French Revolution. They have killed orders of magnitude more people than any other group, and they claim the moral high ground in social justice warrior nonsense. I mean, the French Revolution, Hitler, Mao, Pol Pot, Mao, um, that's Stalin, that, that whole crowd. It's just unbelievable what they did. And we probably haven't had a full reckoning yet. So uh, that's undeniable. Now I've lost my track for a moment. I must be getting tired. You have to help me a bit. Where did I got to? You don't know either. John? I was talking, oh yes, talking, talking about how these things happen. So when, what, what you know, uh, tacit knowledge, sorry, it just, I'd lost the drift for a moment. Um, tacit knowledge comes from a Hungarian called uh, Polanyi, Michael Polanyi. And he was a young man writing to Einstein and Einstein was responding in the early part of the 20th century, very smart non-practicing Jew, as far as I can discover. His son is a Nobel Prize winner at Toronto in chemistry. His father was doing chemistry when he was writing to Einstein. But then what happened in 1917? See, this is the absence of history in your schools. This is a date that every school should teach. 
it was that the assassination of Ferdinand or no 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 that was before that it's the Russian Revolution when when Lenin started communism and Polanyi was in Hungary next door to Russia knew that if this succeeded they would be forced in the same direction and he went to a conference a little later in uh, in Moscow and he managed to talk to uh, the Soviet Minister of Science and he said what's Soviet science policy going to look like and he gave the Marxist answer the proletariat will tell the scientists what to do well that's the death of science you can't tell scientists what to do you can tell technicians what to do but scientists have to think thoughts that have never been thought before if they're going to lead science you can tell PhDs what to do because they're just dotting I's and crossing T's but the stuff that really matters doesn't work that way and Polanyi knew that and what drives leading edge science it's always fun to talk to them and I've had that privilege of a number of times it's not like a scientific paper when you have dinner together the, the the words that come out when they're talking about their work is so cool <laughs> so elegant so beautiful you don't see those words in scientific papers but that's what drives you uh, if you're doing something that hasn't been done before and when it works it, it's it's an ecstatic high it's addictive uh, and the starting point is impossible to describe uh, but not impossible to recognize yourself and Polanyi managed to get out of Hungary just in time to save his life going by Germany to Manchester and there he became very interested in working class men uh, they would come home from work and have their dinner and then they'd go to the shed at the bottom of the garden where they made amazing things this is the days before computerization so many almost all working class men did something very well and they were proud of the fact that they did it very well they weren't machine minders and he discovered they did some really amazing things and one of the turning points was he discovered a man who made superb violins uh, who said they were superb the man or someone else who's the right person to tell you whether a violin is superb who's seen or heard a lot of them hmm? not seen a lot played them it's a violinist who's going to tell you how good your violin is and Polanyi learned about this man because he'd been talking to the people in the Halley Orchestra who told him about him and when the man was asked how he knew when he'd made a good violin he said I know but I can't tell you I can't describe it real knowledge that cannot be described falling in love is the same you know it's happened you can't describe why you can describe sexual attraction that's easy but love that's something quite different and much more important conversion is tacit knowledge medicine has tacit knowledge in it if you're a good doctor you become aware of things that the patient hasn't even said and you ask the right question because of that that's the joy of clinical medicine which you can do best now in the developing world because you don't have all the equipment telling you what to do I realized how blessed I was to be trained when I was my one of my 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 second daughter married an oncologist now he wouldn't have got through residency if he hadn't been living in the apartment at the top of our house uh, he's a very very good oncologist too good because he was having his soul bent by the practices he saw going on in medicine several people have been at this conference have alluded to that and I remember talking to him to try and understand what was going on and then I realized what it was he didn't work any longer hours than I did I did a hundred hours a week for two or three years uh, but if I was on emergency call and I admitted say 10 patients in a, in a night which could happen I would put them to bed and in eight of them I would 
know what was going to happen because there was no machine, no, no lab result that was going to change that. Only in 20% of them was I waiting for a result from the laboratory. Now you can't move without a result from the laboratory, right? You look at the patient through a screen of reductive data because, and you have to. So Derek would do the same sort of work, but he was waiting for the machine in eight out of 10 patients. That's nowhere near as satisfying as being the person who makes the decision. Uh, and you know when you made a right decision, sometimes before the patient says a word. I, I remember the first time it happened to me. Uh, I'd been thinking about tacit knowledge. Um, and I was at National Heart Hospital in London. And a guy came in who was somewhat inarticulate, working man. And, you know, the usual thing, he sat down. And I said, well, what can I do for you? And he couldn't get his words out. And I knew he got angina. And he hadn't said a word. It was hours later before I worked out what had happened. I, I, I started pursuing that line and that was what he had. And then I realized hours later, he had been scrunching up his hands right in front of me, trying to find the words, you know, the squeezing of angina. He didn't have a word for it, uh, but he told me with his hands. Now it's a very simple version of tacit knowledge. Uh, not immediately apparent from somebody using their fingers, but perfectly adequate and easily able to be tested in that context. You, you should talk about your conversion in the same way. I always say to people, I can't tell you how to become a Christian, except that if you search, you will find. And the more intelligent you are, probably the longer it will take. Because you have so many barriers built into your change uh, by the society in which you've been brought up. Uh, that works very well. Uh, when you see someone get converted on the spot, that moves me to tears. I mean, the only thing that moves me to tears at this stage of my life is grace. When it erupts into life, uh, that will make me cry. Nothing else will. Um, so I can't talk about those things very easily. I could this morning with only four people there, you know, but I, re I apologize that, that it was somewhat emotional, which is not expected with me, but that's what happens. And we need to talk about it that way. Because everybody wants joy, but nobody can, nobody can give it because it doesn't come that way. My joy I give unto you, not as the world gives, says Christ. My joy is a joy that will be there in any setting. And you have to go and read about the martyrs to see that uh, right up to the present day. No, that was a long tirade in all sorts of directions. Uh, that's what happens with me. Sorry. No, no one gives tirades quite the way you do, Dr. <laughs> Thank um, you. You're welcome. That's true. Um, let's take a break uh, for, uh, we were supposed to break at 2, it's 220 right now. So let's break until 245. And what happens then? And then um, what I'd like to do to close out our time today is collect any final questions that you have on the Sermon on the Mount. I think, uh, John, we've, covered, I, I think we've covered most of them now. Yeah, I think we've covered most of the ground, but there's maybe some particular things. I've got a question about anxiety yeah. I would really love to get at with you. Yeah, uh, and so, I have one for you to think about in the interval. Okay, very good. How does the sermon end and what is it saying to you? Good. Yeah, excellent. Excellent. Yeah. yeah. So that's great. So we'll take that challenge. Maybe that will foster some discussion. But if you have any questions, why don't you feed them into the uh, into that, uh, chat room and then I'll make sure to feed those or leave have them at hand. either way is fine. Um, yep. But uh, and then, uh, Dr. Patrick, I want to hear one thing from you, uh, a book that I've never heard you mention, but I've heard is quite important, which is uh, Charles Taylor's The Secular Age. And uh, Yeah, well, uh, it is to me, but it's another one like After Virtue. Have you read it? Yes. I, I, I Well, I, I, I made it up to about 350, 400 pages, <laughs> which yeah. a friend of mine on a faculty uh, of a major Big Ten school said that was a big achievement. <laughs> well, yeah, but it has a lot of important stuff in it. Yes. I mean, he's a Marxist Catholic. 
yeah. or was. I didn't know he was Marxist. I well, he was very left of centre. He ran for the NDP in Parliament, didn't get in, but but uh, in Montreal. Uh, but what I loved about that book was his recognition. Uh, he didn't call it tacit knowledge, and he didn't really acknowledge Polanyi, but. Yeah. But he was willing to recognize that reality. He is a real Catholic in that sense. Yes. Yeah. He, he I, I think that's one of the major themes of his work is the loss of that. Yeah. Yeah. He, he knows that that is the case. And he's not alone in that, is he? Uh, oh, he's the other guy. I was reading a bit of him the other day uh, uh, who talks about love as, in a very deep way as the only way to present the gospel. Another Catholic. It'll probably come by the time we get back. It's very annoying this phenomenon that, <laughs> that that God inflicts on us for some reason or another. I actually went to the memory clinic because uh, about three years ago uh, I went along and I said, "Look, I have a problem. I'm sorry to be. In some sense, it's probably wasting your time, but I used to be able to remember uh, the title, uh, the publisher." Uh, and the author of every major book I'd written and quite a lot about that book. Now I only get two out of three. Um, <laughs> my, my mother died out of, Alzheim of Alzheimer's. Am I going the same way? And they said, well, it'd be fun to put you through the whole battery of tests. And they did everything, including the MRI. And uh, then at the end, the uh, psychologist said, um, well, welcome to the human race. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with your brain except that it's... Uh, catching up with other peoples in the process of aging. But uh, that was reassuring. Uh, so uh, I just, uh, it's actually quite fun because now I, I can say to people that the name of the person I want, uh, some of you will know, or the title, some of you know, and I tell them a little bit and somebody in the audience shouts out the right answer and you immediately recognize it, of course. So, and that's fun for everybody. And it also resets the clock because when you smile in a lecture, I know that you've rebooted to a degree. It's a reset button to a degree. Not, you shouldn't tell jokes, that doesn't do it, because especially the men spent the whole of the rest of the time trying to remember the joke. Uh, but an ironic comment that just makes you a little wisp of a smile, that, that's a reset button. And so uh, people don't notice how long you've been talking for when you can do that every now and again. So uh, Jesus had, he told these lovely stories and he did it many times. I'm sure many people heard them many times, but they just loved hearing him do it and watching how other people responded. Why we don't take notice of that and get so prissy about having a nice academic presentation of something, nobody will remember that. I, I When I'm setting up a talk, I, I, I will often do it in two columns. There'll be the idea I'm really wanting to deal with. There will be the argument and there'll be the illustrations. And most people going back will start with the illustrations and get to the argument that way because we are made for stories. God made us that way. So, and doctors, you have innumerable stories out there and you, you need to use them. You know, I talked about um, uh, a window on heaven uh, in the previous session and forgotten her name now. Um, Diane Comp. No, oh, it's gone for the moment. No, Diane Comp, thank you. That's easy. Uh, she was brought back to faith and she tells the stories of how children did that to her. Uh, and it's a book you should have. And when you see a secondhand copy cheap, put it on your shelf to give to the next family that's going to lose a child. Uh, it gives them hope. But this is not the end. So, Okay, so we'll break. See each other in about uh, 17 minutes. Okay, great.